Oh, my yeah. the bakery I want to do is called Rock and Roll. Rock and Roll. Come on, it'll be right. amazing. That's right, Rock and Roll. I mean, see? Yeah, we could do that. Let's do it. I'm Allison Hagendorf. America, this is the next. Hello, Times Square. Hello, Madison Square Garden. Welcome to X Games Aspen. I'm Allison Hagendorf. I'm the live announcer of the BMA. Welcome to Rock This with Allison Hagendorf. Yeah, this is Allison Hagendorf. Allison Hagendorf. My girl. Allison Hagendorf. I am first and foremost a music fan. You may very well be the most important person in rock and roll. You're on the Allison Hagendorf show. We're going to go dive deep. You're the connected fish. You have a musician's heart. And she rocks. My name is Allison Hagendorf. You're on the Mike Shinoda show. You get nervous. Sometimes you're a nervous Nelly. Yeah, I think I'm <laughs> excellent. You're very good at this, Allison. Thank you. Yo, baby. I want to put him on my album cover. You're like, I'm on the way. The template for how you go I to a rock it. show. Damiano David, it might be the first time you hear my name. Well, Allison, one really funny thing that I, I wanted to mention. We don't do this. Only, yeah. Literally only with you. You're first sharing that with me. I know, I played you some of the songs. Together in 1983 as a band. She's fit, like she's a badass all around. What you did for my whole life career. You made me feel so seen. I'm being like really vulnerable right now. This feels like a therapy session. This has gotten very self-revelatory. <laughs> Hello, my fellow music lovers, and welcome to the Allison Hayden Show. Hello, my fellow music lovers, and welcome to the Allison Hagendorf Show. This is where we celebrate the universal love of music and the rock and roll spirit that lives in each of us. I am so glad you're here. We are coming to you from DWP Studios, and I want to give a shout out to our presenting sponsor, Cloudwater, and our friends and partners at Sweetgrass Vodka and Karma Sauce as well, who all fuel my life and help make this show possible, along with you. Your support means the world to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. UK comedian, host of The Great British Bake Off, painter, musician, and national treasure, Noel Fielding is joining me in the studio today. He has a brand new show on Apple TV called The Completely Made Up Adventures of Dick Turpin, and let me tell you, it is hilarious. But what amazes me most about Noel is that he is a true renaissance man who follows his passions and manifests them into so many different avenues. We are all so multifaceted. It's our different passions and our interests that make us who we are. We are so much more than one path or one job. You know, many people know me as the head of Rocket Spotify, which was a wonderful chapter of my life, but it was a very small chapter of my life and my career. What most people might not realize is that I am a huge science nerd. I actually graduated pre-vet and pre-med from college. I grew up wanting to be TV legend Dick Clark MTV's Matt Pinfield, and animal lover Steve Irwin, and I couldn't decide which path to take, so I sort of pursued all of them, and I have somehow managed to incorporate all of those passions along the way. I hosted Times Square New Year's Eve for many years. I interview musicians, and I get fans excited about new music. I'm a certified health coach who also helps people use music as medicine, and I'm really proud of all of these different facets. But I still always feel like I'm just getting started, as there are so many more titles that I want to add to my repertoire. Book author is one, game show host is another, and I not so secretly have always wanted to be one of the adult characters on Sesame Street. I'm just putting all of this into the universe. By the way, happy three and a half birthday to Elmo. It's like forever three and a half. All of my pursuits and passions are just different ways to help spread that positivity and love into the world. We have more in common than we think, which is why I love celebrating both the extraordinary and the ordinary in all of my guests and in all of you. Okay, coming up after this short break, we have British Bake Off star and Dick Turpin himself, Noel Fielding, in studio. And I may or may not have him weigh in on one of my signature sweet treats. Stay tuned. My guest today is the British comedian, actor, and artist known for The Mighty Boosh and The Great British Bake Off. His hilarious new Apple TV show, The Completely Made Up Adventures of Dick Turpin, is out now. And most importantly, he is a massive music lover, and he is a goth 
for life. Noel Fielding, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. I I'm am thrilled you're here. I'm so excited. This is my show. I think I feel like this show's been designed for me. It, it has been, actually. I might be dreaming. I'm quite jet lagged. Is this really happening? It's real. This, this is, is real, real life. life. I actually sort of wore this, although oh. I love Kiss. Yeah. Your fashion sense is intimidating because it's so amazing. I wanted to like bring a little like flair for you. You brought a little bit of kiss. I actually do want to know about this coat. This coat? Yeah, this coat is special. You know what? It was very cheap. It's like one of those coats that looks expensive, but it's actually cheap. It's like a carpet, so it's quite, mm. it's quite warm. And functional. Yeah, it's from a yeah. really cool shop called Lazy Oaf, and it, it was like $60 or something. It's amazing. It's really not about fashion. It's about style. It's about... You know? seeing something and going that's gonna work and it doesn't really matter where it or you have to you know you have to have it if you see yeah. like a, a pink leopard skin jacket you go that's for me that's right? it. that was made for me that was made <laughs> I've for never you. seen anyone else with this jacket no. either. but I had this kiss jacket that I used to wear on stage in the mighty bush when I was way thinner and it was like a child's paper jacket they had those like little paper zip up jackets oh, yeah. From it. it was like from 1979 or something and basically I went to Camden Market in London and this guy said they uh, found there was a shipwreck in Bermuda I don't know if this is mm. real or not We're there was not a sure. shipwreck in Bermuda and they there's some divers went down and they found some sort of uh, cargo canisters there and they brought them up and they all had kiss jackets in them <laughs> <laughs> So we bought a whole crate of kiss jackets wow. and it was the last one. This is what he said. That sounds like a Dick Turpin type of story, sounds actually. Sounds like a Mighty Boosh story. Yeah, that's like a, that's like a Mighty Boosh, Dick Turpin <laughs> so combo. A merman took me down and Gene Simmons was down there. Yeah, I know, it's crazy, right? I still have that jacket. That's pretty amazing. I love those jackets, those little concerts. Of course. Jackets. I mean, those are like the gems we have to hang on to, yeah. you know? And I feel like Gene would approve. And you've he would. got Ace Freely there. Yeah, we got, met, we got them all. I saw Ace Freely really in Perth in Australia at the airport and, Had I, that and I just I chased him he was walking off in the, into the distance and I was like I was like Ace I love you I had a kiss patch on my jeans and uh and uh I said I love you can I get a picture and he just went no oh, <laughs> I was like please and he don't was like, meet your heroes no. yeah and I just in a way I love that he said no uh -huh. and I don't love him any less yeah of course the Space Man. I did just host the final Kiss show ever at Madison Square Garden, so and jealous. Ace was not there, but Paul and Jean, Paul. And Tommy and Eric. I mean, it was one of the most spiritual. Yeah, it was. It, it really was. Just to see these legends, they're, they're <laughs> septuagenarians, they're in their 70s, like wearing like. They were smart though, weren't they? The yeah. makeup and the costumes. Yeah, pioneers. They sort of, in a way, it's like if you wear those sort of crazy costumes. It doesn't really matter how old you are. That's true. So, and there was so that smart. bit where they took their makeup off. Do you yeah. remember? And they sort of turned into a proper hair metal band. Yeah, but then and, it came back on. Yeah, and then they, and then Paul Stanley was the sort of heartthrob. Oh, but totally. I love Kiss. They I were know, my they're, band. They're, when I was a little kid, my mom and dad took me to a Kiss concert. This is a true story, right? And my auntie was a seamstress and a, made costumes, and she made me a tiny Gene Simmons costume. I was like six or something, and uh, the tour manager saw me. This is in the 70s. I was like a little kid. And he said, You've got, I've got to take you backstage to meet Gene because he'll love this because it was a really right. amazing costume. Aww. And so he took me backstage and I went into this room and there was no one in there. And I just thought, this is a bit weird, right? And he said, he'll be back in a minute. And I stood in there and he came in and saw me. <laughs> and just, no, what happened is he didn't come back. The rest of the band did. And they saw me and they were like, Gene shrunk. What's happening? Oh my God. It was so weird. Wait, did you ever get to meet Gene in yeah, that capacity? And okay, you in did. And he loved it. And then years later, I tried to tell him this story, and he wouldn't believe that it was me. But he did say he remembered. Oh, do you have a picture of yourself in this? I feel like I, I think my mom and dad might have like one. This is like the seventies, so there was like one right. really out of focus bad of photograph. Of course, yeah. Now, it, now it would be like video footage. Yeah. It'd be happening live. People would be streaming. You're it. absolutely this right. This is like who is that in that photo? It's like faded from the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Your parents seemed like they were so cool. They yeah. really introduced you to a lot of amazing music. I was a little bit embarrassed because my parents were like into Black Sabbath and Kiss and literally just uh, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, all that so heavy cool. rock sort of white snake. And, uh, and I think all my friends' parents weren't like that. They weren't cool. 
And so when my friends came around from school, it was like, they were like, your mum and dad are really weird. What's this music? Right. <laughs> be quite scared. And, Did uh, you think it was cool though? Or you no, just, you not wish when I was it, 10. Okay, okay. When I was 10, I wanted to listen to Adam Ant and stuff yeah, like oh, that. Yeah, oh yeah. And I was like, this is embarrassing. But as I grew up, I was, I, I sort of, I realized how lucky I was. Wait, they really, they really paved the way for your music taste. Yes. For your like setting. What about your hair? I mean, your hair has been amazing your whole life. Yeah, weirdly, my dad still got quite a lot of hair, quite dark hair. I feel like my mum was, my mum only fancied rock people, only okay. had pictures of rock people in the house, and was obsessed with you know Robert Plant and Ozzy Osbourne and all these people, and they were kind of the people that were our heroes when we were growing up. You know, all the alternative people. Yeah. Uh, you know, going forward right up to Motley Crue and, and everyone really that had been in a band, The Faces, Rod Stewart, of course. Ronnie Wood, The Stones, Keith Richards. And so that was the kind of normal look in my house. And, and well, that I, was the standard. <laughs> that's the standard look. And your parents were like partying. You had like an unconventional upbringing. They were young. They were like 19 when they had me. Got so it. they were a bit naughty. Uh, and it was the 70s, so they were partying a lot. And they used to just take me to parties as a kid. And I'd sleep under the coats, you know. It was quite exciting. Oh my god. It wasn't like today. When did you really like embrace like your goth self? Like I love that that's been such a huge part of your identity. Oh well, when I was really young, like 16, I went out with a girl. She was, I think my first girlfriend was like 16. I was like 16, 15. I might have been a year younger, 15. And she was 16 and her and her friends were goths. And they used to dress me up and back comb my hair. Amazing. And like Robert Smith from The Cure. The best, the best. And I let them, mm -hmm. and I quite liked of it. Of course. It was quite, it was quite a powerful thing to yeah. have sort of goth girls dressing you up like a doll. And yeah, it was quite an amazing. Lucky you. Yeah, I was very lucky. Yeah. Looking back, I was quite lucky, wasn't I? The goth thing. I think I always dabbled with the goth thing. I was always a part-time goth. You don't want to be a full-time goth, do you? It's, <laughs> it's too much true. work. That's a little too much of a commitment. <laughs> it's too much stress. It's true. A lot of anxiety. It is. <laughs> I've played a lot of goths, so I played Richmond in the IT crowd. And I sort of based that on lots of my friends, because I always thought, I only know posh goths. I don't know any any sort of cockney right, rock and right, right. They're always very posh and they're very- The fancy goths, yeah. yeah. So I use the voice from Pink Floyd, all the people in Pink Floyd, all kind of speak like that with that very posh accent. <laughs> I thought that's the perfect goth voice. Um, so I've played a lot of goths and I, yeah, and now I'm the goth in the Bake Off. What's quite good about the Bake Off is I, it looks like someone's dropped a spider in a sort of a box full of cakes. It's just like cupcakes. It's like, who's this guy? I should I, not be I, here. I die that you're the co-presenter of the it's Bake Off. So you, like, please, you're so, such an unlikely presenter, but you're no. such a fan favorite and you're fantastic on it. How it, did that all come about? Well, the head of the channel wanted me to do it and I didn't know, I didn't know what the show was. I'd, Funny enough, my friend who's in Kasabian, the band, yes. was like, get on Bake Off, it's quite good, especially when you're hungover, it's like warm, it's like a cuddle. You know <laughs> when you're really, cuddle. you're in a bad place, you've, you've been up for too many days, yes. and you need a warm cuddle from a TV show, and he was like, Bake Off is the one, get on that, give yourself a little cuddle, it'll bring you back round. And I watched it, and I thought, this is quite good, this show. Mm. And I also thought, this might be quite a good show to do, you know, like to present. Yeah. And then a year later, I ended up presenting it. I don't know how that happened. You have to be careful what energy you put out yeah. into the universe. Well, I, I would love that. I mean, that's like a dream come true for me. Like one, I, well, one, I love hosting, but I, like you, have many, you know, multi, multiple talents. I'm a baker. Oh, yeah. I am a baker. I and I, you might I, be. I did bring something here today. Are you good? I, I did. Bet you're good. I did. Oh, wow. I actually brought you one of my signature oh my God. items. This is good. Look There's at no these. pressure, but wow. these are my chocolate chip peanut butter cookies. Oh I will show God. for the camera. They look amazing. Thank you. So you can bake. I bake. Is it there, is my therapy. It is there is. anything you can't do? Um. What are you not good at? Are you good at swimming? Yes, I thought you I'm athletic. Play. I am athletic. So I'm, you're good at sports. I am good at sports. You can bake. I can bake. You're rock. You're pure rock. Yeah. You do TV. You do radio. You mm -hmm. do all these podcasts. You can do everything. Acting. You've been in films. Yes. No, I have not been in films. I feel like you could be. I do like acting. I can dabble in it. Yes. I would say I'm not good. I'm not good at basketball. <laughs> I'm not good at basketball. <laughs> I'm five two. <laughs> and I'm not good at basketball. There's no pressure, but I would like for you, and to I taste one of just these. in case I brought you a napkin and a this plate. Is, 
just oh, in case. This is amazing. Wow. We can heat it up for you after we can dip it in, dunk it some milk if you'd like. Wow, that's good. Thank you. Wow, that's deep. Oh, I appreciate There's that. There's a lot of depth in there, there isn't there? They, yes, there are. I really like, make hearty cookies. I'll just put them down for now, but. Yeah, that's really good. Oh, thank you. So if I were on the show, like, what would you say about it? You'd get a handshake for that, I reckon. I would? Yeah, but not from, okay. <laughs> the handshake for me is worth nothing. Okay. Paul All right, well, that's good to know. You need Paul Hollywood. Okay, maybe You need I the can... blue eyes from Paul Hollywood. I think he'd give you a handshake for that. Okay. Prue would like that. Definitely totally. worth the calories, darling. She'd love it. Thank Check, you. Why don't you come on the show? I would be, I was hoping you would say that. I would be honored to do that. I can get you. I can get you in. The bakery I want to do is called Rock and Roll. Rock and Knoll. Come on. That's be right. Amazing. Rock and Knoll. I mean, See? I, yeah, we could do that. Let's do it. Wait, but you, but you never pursued music? As a musician? I was in a band right. years ago. And then Julian was in quite a few bands from the Mighty Boosh. Yeah. And so what was quite good about the Boosh is that we could just write anything. So if we were doing, if we wanted, there was a merman or a mer, you know, a monster in the show and it was a funky monster, then we could write like a sort of parliament or a, you know, a funkadelic tune because it's comedy. So you can sort of move around the genres. Yeah. You could write a reggae tune or you could write like a dance track or like a, a house track or you could write like a heavy rock track or a, a psycho goth track, you know, industrial goth music. You could do whatever you wanted. That was what the freedom of comedy is that you could, because you're sort of slightly parodying those genres. Yeah. You could just do any music that you wanted. So we loved writing music because and he's into heavy stuff as well. He likes ACDC. We both love ACDC. And I think I grew up, my mum and dad were really into ACDC when I grew up, on Scott era. Yeah. Um, big influence. Uh, but, it, but we also like, he likes jazz. He's the jazz man. And we like electro music. That's we great. We like everything really. I love everything, You know, yeah. when music is difficult, isn't it? Because you like craft work, but then you yeah. like... You know, ACDC, it's hard to sort of pick one genre and stick to it you get bored. So I was in a few bands and he was in a few bands. And weirdly enough, the Boosh was sort of appealed to people that did music. Like we'd always win enemy awards. And it's amazing. People used to watch it on their tour bus. It was like the tour bus thing. And then I became friends with lots of people in bands because of the Boosh. So like Les Claypool from yes. Primus. Right. And people like about that, that would just go. That's so cool. We just watch the Boosh all the time on rotation. <laughs> You also hung out with Amy Winehouse a bit, right? Yeah, I was friends with Amy yeah. a little bit. Yeah. She was in Camden, same time as me, and Pete Doherty and the Libertines, uh, that whole scene, uh, Razorlight. We were all hang out in the same Razor. pub, actually, in North London. Really amazing pub, and just, oh. you know, brilliant, really. Brilliant, brilliant. Tragic, that. Tragic. It's so tragic. I mean, it's so crazy to think, like, so young, I know. imagine what she would be doing I know. now. That's what's weird about those, you know, that 27 club yeah. people dying at 27. And now I'm, as you get older, you could think, wow, they miss so much. So much. It's like 27's nothing, is it? It's wild to think like, well, the 27 club in particular, like Kurt Cobain's my favorite, yeah. Jim Morrison, Jim Love Hendrix. Nirvana. Like these are like literally my favorite, all yeah. of them are my favorites. Jim Morrison, And Hendrix. it's like to think about. Graham Parsons. Right. It's like, Sometimes to create such art like that, it yeah. has to be with such darkness. You know, it's yeah. like, it's where the art comes from. I did sort of see a very funny interview with Lemmy about Jimi Hendrix. And he what said, <laughs> he said, because he was Jimi Hendrix's roadie at one point, I think. Really? Yeah, Lemmy was. Okay. And then he loved him. And uh, he used to be his roadie for a bit before he was in Hawkwind and then in yeah. Motorhead. And he was talking about at the end that Jimmy was saying, he said, imagine, people were saying, imagine what you would have done if he'd have been alive. And I think Lemmy was saying, he had this sort of idea that he was going to have like 20, 20 guitars and, and do classical music and sort of like an opera. And Lemmy just went, sounds awful, actually. <laughs> That sounds terrible. It sounds terrible, exactly. Oh my God. Which I love. I love the oh idea that you would go, that sounds terrible. Oh my God, it sounds terrible. Yeah. We have to keep these greats alive forever. I know. Forever, like oxygen chambers. When like they, they start just... disappearing, you really feel like bits of culture are disappearing now, yeah. don't you? Isn't there will scary? never be bands like that ever again. There will never be dynamic duos like no. that ever again. Like Think Mick about that. I you know? know, that will never happen again. 
Pick because in order to create that dynamic, it had to be time in real life, I, I you know, know, like together in the trenches. And what they've gone through as well, and people like Ozzy Osbourne, right. you just can't believe they're still here and you're just, it's amazing that they are and they're still, Ozzy Osbourne's still hilarious. Hilarious. And still amazing. And I love never, his new music. Never not pleased to see Ozzy Osbourne. Oh my God. Ever. Love Black Sabbath. The love best. Black Sabbath. Love Ozzy Osbourne. Of course. And yeah, still making great music. He's still, still got a good voice. He still, still funny. sounds amazing. <laughs> He's still hilarious. How is he doing it? Yeah, I don't, there's there's only one Ozzy. I know. What what was it that turned you to comedy to begin with? Well, I think you know in your heart, don't you, that you're not. I'd love to have been in a band, and I'd love to have been. I was in a band for a bit, but I knew it wasn't what I was best at. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I knew I was always quite funny, and I was always interested in comedy. I had lots of friends who were in bands, and I was in bands a little bit, and Julian was in bands a little bit, but we were both obsessed with comedy. And then what we tried to do with the Bush was try and make a comedy where you could um, include music as well, and animation, and elements of stand up and live comedy, and then sort of you know, filmic stuff and try and do a create a world where you could do anything. Yeah. And include references to Black Sabbath or Led Zeppelin or whatever you wanted to do or, you know, funk or hip hop or anything. Um, and it was kind of fun. So we did get to do the music as well. Yeah. And we were always quite rock and roll for comedians. Right, right. But to be actually rock and roll, you know, it's like <sighs> my brother's good friends with Chris Robinson you know mm -hmm. and their Love new single's pretty good isn't it yes Black Crows are great and it's like you know but to, to do that there's a different it's a different set of skills it's a different thing you just know what you're good at really and I was always obsessed with comedy and Steve Martin and Richard Pryor and you know uh, Monty Python and all this right. stuff and that's really where out you that's where we felt m more comfortable you know and so doing this new show with Dick Turpin it was it was like a return to doing the kind of comedy that I was doing mm -hmm. 15 years ago. And I hadn't sort of, I didn't want to, it was really difficult because me and Julian were together for 20 years and we did loads of good stuff and it, you know, we got amazing opportunities and it's like a marriage really. And yes. when you split up, it's like a divorce. It's as a sort of moment, as a sort of five year period of grieving. Yeah. <laughs> and then you try to get with other people, comedy people, and you can't quite make it it's work. It same. doesn't feel the same. And so I thought, well, I'll do things like the Bake Off and my art, my painting and stuff instead. And maybe that was the comedy that I was meant to do. Maybe one day we'll get back together. And then I suppose Dick Turpin came along and because it's a period comedy and because it's a, a real character and uh, it was a production company I wanted to work with and Apple was really exciting to, to work with them. And, uh, and the cast are really good and Hugh Bonneville's in it and there's loads of great comedians in it. It just felt like the right time to come back to this yeah. sort of thing. And so it felt like it could have bushy elements in it, but not be too bushy, you know, because it's a sort of period comedy. And also yeah. Dick Turpin's quite a cool character, you know, uh, to play. So it just felt right, really. And then I really enjoyed it. And it made me realize how much I'd miss doing out and out you're scripted you're comedy. You're so good in it. You are so good in it. It's you're so lovable in it. It's hard to do the main part because Julian was the one right. carrying the boost, you know, and I was the one flitting in and out. And it's easier to be a crazy character and turn up and do a little turn or do a more extreme character. You know, playing old Greg or someone is great because you come in and you're playing such a, 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 a weird extreme sort of energy. It's great to do those things. As a comedian, that's what you want to do. But holding the whole thing down with a character yeah. that is really the audience's perspective and is much more straight is really hard because the temptation is always to go bigger and more comedic. But you have to sort Keep of it hold grounded. it down all the time to let all the other characters work. So I don't know. It was fun. It was really good fun. And I'm glad, I'm really glad I did it. And yet yeah, slightly renewed my sort of love of comedy in a weird way. I was starting to drift away into art and other stuff. You know, music's always there for me because yeah. I love music. But I was sort of starting to drift into painting and this sort of pulled me back in a little bit. But that's what's so cool and unique about you is that you have so many different interests and passions and you're you're really great. Thank at, you. You're really great. I've seen your work. Your painting of your work is- I love painting. Like you have a successful career as a painter. It's I'd, wild. I'd love to do, I do shows occasionally, but you know what? I just love painting. And then when you try to do it, you know, for you try to do exhibitions and make it a career thing again, it becomes, it slightly kills it a little bit for mm -hmm. me. And I right. love just painting and I love having exhibitions if it's with the right people and 
and I will definitely do that as I get older, but it's almost like I, the bit the bit I love is the painting bit. Right. And that's the, the thing. actual art of it, the yeah. expression. You know what's interesting? When we were doing the bush, the bit that we used to really love was me and him sitting in a room coming up with something like a song or a character or so we're going to have this character who's like a, a you know a, a merman but he's a funky merman he's got the funk in his cave and we do a funkadelic song or a parliament type song those things were really exciting when you come up with them and then that buzz of coming up with stuff when you know it's good and and you're doing it and it's just you guys you haven't shown anyone yet yeah that's the real that's the, the big, magic yeah that's and the magic all the other stuff it's great that you show it to an audience and they like it and you know, and then they become your fans and then you do live stuff and there's a real connection and a bond. I love that as well. That's like a slightly different thing. But the magic of coming up with ideas and sitting in a room and playing sort of just the fun, that's the best yeah. thing in the world. That you get paid for that is ridiculous. Yeah. So for this, for Dick Turpin, because I was able to get involved in the writing as well a little bit, I never really want to be in anything that I can't write on. Like I'm not really an actor in that way. I've got friends who are really brilliant actors, you know. And it's a very different discipline. So whenever you get, I get sort of grand ideas that I'm an actor, I sort of chat to my friends who are real actors, you know, like I live quite close to Benedict Cumberbatch. Oh, you know? wow. And uh, he's such an amazing, he's an amazing actor. But then we're very different beasts, you know? It's like I know I'm a stand-up at heart and I know that I'm more into art and I can do a bit of acting. But when I chat to him about acting, He's definitely an actor, you know, it's, he's got... He's so, so talented. Yeah, he's he, brilliant. He's an actor. He's an like, actor. He is an actor's actor. He's a fine yeah. actor. Yeah, and so actors are slightly different, you know, and um, so it's good to get to be able to do that through comedy. What we wanted to do with Dick Turpin was make something a little bit silly and a little bit surreal and whimsical and, um, uh, and make it, and concentrate on making it funny. So it's, that it wasn't, And it's really, like... Like, there's a lot of heart. Yeah. There's a lot of heart in this show. And so That's not, what I love about it. It's not it. a comedy drama, really. Right. There's been lots of comedy dramas, and comedy dramas are brilliant, and there's so much good stuff on on streaming platforms and so many good comedies. We just wanted to make something a little bit more... Um, we are quite influenced by the Holy Grail and uh, Princess Bride. And yes. All the, we wanted to make something a little bit unusual. I know there was a film called Your Highness that Danny McBride did, who I love, mm -hmm, Danny McBride. Yes. So uh, I think, but apart from him, I don't think anyone's done a sort of period comedy for a while. And because Dick Tappin's a real person and did used to rob stagecoaches and did get hanged, it's quite an interesting character. And Americans don't really know Dick Turpin, so it's a bit of a blank canvas. You can yes. Have, you've got creative freedom because no one really knows what he did. He's like Robin Hood, really, for us. He's as famous as Robin Hood. But right. I think in America, Definitely everyone knows Robin Hood. Everyone knows Robin Hood. But they don't really Less know no Dick, Dick Turpin. Turpin. So it's quite interesting because they're intrigued right. that this is a real person, but they don't quite know the story. So, so you were able to make it the way you wanted to do it. It's a very different version, yeah. My Dick Turpin's a vegan and a pacifist. <laughs> It's a pacifist. Great hair, of course. Amazing <laughs> a, fashion sense. He's a dandy, a vegan, a pacifist, and he likes to use he's, creativity instead of violence. He's so lovable. But everyone He was else, like the Ted Lasso of yeah. Highwaymen. <laughs> I love you know? Ted Lasso. Yeah, yeah that I guy's amazing, Lasso. Jason. Yeah. He's sort of got a nice... So he's got a nice uh, way about him, hasn't he? A nice charm. A sort of, a, there's a sort of soul there, isn't there, in that? That's why that was so big, I think. Yes. Yeah, that was huge. In I just feel like in the, in was that the, huge here as well? Yeah. Massive. It was massive. In we all, you know why? Because we all need that. Yeah. The world, there's so much darkness and toxicity. So the to have that love, feel good, morals, values, stories. But that's the thing. We're all trying to escape that's, all the time. I think right. the Bake Off does that. Once you're in the tent, weirdly, I'm sure they didn't make the tent for that reason. But once you're in the tent, it feels like you're in a bubble and you're out. You're hmm. protected from the outside. You're like in this state, the safe space. Yeah, and the world has gone a little bit dark. So you notice it because I've got kids now. So you know, I've got a five-year-old and a three-year-old daughter, and you notice that you're trying to shield them from hmm. the darkness of the world, and it makes you realise how dark the world can be, yes. and then it makes you realise that you're spending your entire life trying to create alternate worlds like the mighty bitch was an alternate world and dick turpin's an alternate world where people can go in and it's safe and there isn't any of that stuff and it's a bit more fun and silly and weird and surreal yeah. and dreamlike and and a happy place so yeah. i feel like i spend my entire life creating 
worlds where there's no darkness <laughs> or a little well, bit of darkness. To, what's interesting because a lot of you know comedians there's a lot of darkness. A yeah. lot of comedians have admitted that they've turned to comedy as a way to escape darkness. Yes. You know, have you found that in Absolutely. In and your I journey? think that some people can harness that darkness mm -hmm. and they can talk about the real world and, and the dark things like Louis C.K. and J Ricky mm -hmm. Gervais and Bill Burr are really good at talking about, you know, about real things, you know, and they're really brilliant at yes. sort of, at, at sort of, honing in on those things and you but then there are other comedians who take you on a journey or take you to a different place and make you come with them on a little so that you're you feel like you've escaped from the world right and that, I've always wanted to be that kind of comedian really where you go come with me and we'll go somewhere where we don't have to think about any of the the reality of life that is crushing us. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's go to fantasy land. I know. But then, you know, rock bands do that. Kiss do that. Of course, it's the same. What I loved about Kiss when I was a little kid is I was like, who are these look like superheroes? And they're in a band. It's like combining music and the visuals and the look. And you're like, this can't be. I couldn't believe they existed when I was a kid. I was like, who's this? What's this? And they breathe. Gene Simmons breathes fire. It's like, <laughs> what's, what's happening? Right. Where's this happening? I yeah. need to go there now. And I think maybe... The 70s was quite weird. When I grew up in the 70s, there was a lot of superheroes. It was like the Hulk mm -hmm. and uh, people like Kiss, bands like Kiss and The Incredible Hulk. There was a TV show, The Incredible Hulk. Yeah. Superman was still quite big. Spider-Man. There were all these weird superheroes and uh, Wonder Woman and quite fantastical things and quite fantastical bands. And... I think probably me and Julian were a combination of all those things. Yes. So we loved, you know, ACDC and we were mixing ACDC with the Incredible Hulk, really, and sort of all of our childhood weird cartoons that we used to watch. It felt like more escapist time, the 60s right. and 70s. You're absolutely right. Somehow the 60s felt like everything good happened in the 60s from 65 to 70. Like so much good stuff. Yes. And it felt like the 70s was this sort of slight hangover from the 60s, but really weird stuff and maybe because a lot of people were taking drugs and maybe because it was you know uh, flower children and psychedelic mm -hmm. stuff but it felt much more they would go uh, talk about space or they would talk about monsters or they would talk about other worlds and I don't know it just felt more um, like alternative universes Absolutely. were created and then it got a bit real I don't know when it got real. The 80s the, was kind of strange. The people 80s, dressed up. Right. And then maybe the 90s got real. Grunge was quite yeah, real. Yeah, 90s got Although dark. I, yeah, but I loved I loved Nirvana. I love know? the 90s. I love the 90s. I'm a 90s girl. Pearl Jam. All of that stuff's all that. amazing. And in England, the 90s was incredible because of, you know, of Oasis, course, and, Oasis. Blur and all of that yeah. stuff. Uh, I actually think the early 90s was a complete yeah. renaissance for and music. And Supergrass. It was so awesome. And, and pulp. Supergrass and Pulp. Absolutely. Just incredible time to oh, be young was, and going to clubs and dancing to Blur and Pulp and Oasis and Supergrass and Sleeper and all these amazing bands. Yeah, it all got... Uh, but even when me and Julian were making music, when we were making The Boost, we were obsessed with... Um, we were obsessed with the Beastie Boys and Beck, and we were obsessed with Wu-Tang Clan, and we were obsessed with, uh, obsessed with ODB, and uh, all this great cool Keith from the Ultra Magnetic MCs, who's Dr. Oxygen, and we were obsessed with all these different things, and we were trying to make them, put all of these influences into a world, yeah, and then create a sort of strange, magical, fantastical world, really. And I feel like we have managed to do that You've with Dick done Turpin. It. Do you so feel I'm accomplished? Hope. I mean, do you feel successful? You've really no, done it. You never feel successful. <laughs> you always just go, I wish I'd done more. I wish I'd done. I feel like we should have made a film as the Bush because I feel like that was the first thing we wanted to do. And then weirdly, we did live stuff and then went to festivals and then we ended up doing radio. Then we did a TV, couple of TV shows. Well, why are you acting like you're 100? You're old. You, you just turned 50. I <laughs> no, mean, I'm you still 80. can do anything as possible. I'm 80. <laughs> you're also the most youth. By the way, how do you look like this? Look I do your... nothing for my skin. It's like water and that's it. My so dad's got good skin. Like my dad's got good skin. But you know what? You feel older when you're 50, but even if you, you still look a bit younger, something changes and you're, I don't know, there's something, there is a weird change at 50. Mm -hmm. I feel like in my 40s, I was still going, yeah, I can, I'm, I'm fine. And I always, you know, I could still do this forever. And then when you get to 50, you go, oh, I don't know if it's because you, you start to think, oh, how long have I got? left and then I've had all of 
you can't believe how quickly you got to 50 and then you can't you start thinking, well, no, even if it goes really well, <laughs> maybe only got 30 years left. And then you have to really think about what you want to do in that 30 mm. years. Like, what haven't I done? Because you don't want to just do the same thing over and over, which is why I like painting and doing other things. Because all the bake-off, the reason I did it is because it was such an unlikely thing for me yeah. to do that sometimes it's good to scare yourself and go, what well, is this mainstream arena where it's about cakes and you force yourself to do it. And I think what's quite nice about Turpin that this point for me is it's a return to what I did and what I really loved and what I started out doing and so I've really enjoyed it and I've surprised myself at how much I've enjoyed it but you know I might go and do some dance or something <laughs> I'm, See, do some I'm excited ballet. to see what you do because like you're you're, you're, you're 50 you're the you're such a youthful 50 you just did Dick Turpin you still have the bake-off you have a, a you have a yeah. beautiful family I've got you have a two daughters who are family. amazing my kids make me laugh all day, every day, and they dress up the whole time, and they're so funny. It's like a show all the time. Aww. So my life is like a show. It's like they wake you up, and it's a show. Yeah. They're dressed up. They say the most ridiculous things. They're hilarious. That in itself is one of the most unusual, unexpected things that's going to happen in your life. Because when you're sort of into your career, and you're touring around the world, and you're doing this, you never imagine that the most fun you're ever going to have is with a five-year-old and a three-year-old I have a four-year-old and an 18-month-old. Two wow. boys. You have two girls. I've got two girls, yeah. But I, the ours are so wild that my husband and I are like, <laughs> we're not parents, we're zookeepers. Like, our our house is They're mayhem. 24-7, <laughs> the feeding, the constant feedings. Like, it's so, so you're in deep, wild. Oh, we're so months. deep in it. That first 18 months, I love babies, though. Babies yeah. are like sort of, they're like, they're like aliens or something they they're, are they feel like they're really calm and wise and that they know more than you they have this weird energy where you feel like you're they're sort of what they're, it's like wisdom's coming out of them mm -hmm. or something and they know everything that's going on intuitively immediately it's such a weird it's wild holding a baby is one of the it's weirdest the, things when it's your own baby it's the most primal thing that cannot be described. It is so wild. And then as they get older, they blow your mind 500 times yeah. a day, every day. But it is chaos, right? It's chaos. Absolute chaos. How has becoming a father changed you? Wow. I think I've become much less reckless and much more... Um, you just... You worry about your kids all the time because you love them so much. You can't really believe that you could love anyone that much unconditionally. And because it's sort of when you're in a relationship, you love that person, but it's like a sort of competition, isn't it? It's like, yeah. well, it sort of goes backwards and forwards and they love you and you're worried they don't love you enough or they're worried that you don't love them. It's like a sort of, you know, there's all that insecurity and anxiety around it. And then you find the people that you love and, it, and that goes and then, you know, and you find the person, it's great. But with your children, you love them, but there isn't, you don't think, it's not like they're going to start, pure. they're going to start seeing other fathers. <laughs> 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 they're not going to leave you they're for another stuck father. With you. No, they're it's stuck. like, they just basically love you they and they love don't you question it. Yeah. It's mad. They just go, you're my dad and that's fine. Let's put a costume yeah. on. And so it's a different kind of love, isn't it? It's a different kind of, it's like a different kind, although our children do fret and to, this family's not for me. I'm going. Oh, yeah. If we upset oh, yeah. them. If they're upset, they go, yeah. oh, I don't think this family's for me. I'm leaving. Peace out. <laughs> you, go, yeah. you can't even You're open like, the door. Wait. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Good, luck. Good luck. Good luck. Just go into the next room, put a different costume on and come back as someone else. They're so funny. I do love, I do love hanging out with my kids. And I feel like also kids are so... They're like lights. Everything they say is magical and weird and light. Like my five-year-old's like a fairy. She's like a sort of, she's got fairy wings and she's drawing oh. all the time. And she lives in a complete fantasy world. And then my- I wonder where she got that from. My three-year-old's like Iggy, we call, she's called Iggy. So she's like Iggy Pop. She's a punk already. Oh my God, it's amazing. Where's that come from? Just, they're so different. But. Yeah. But I love Iggy Pop as well. That's so great. I, I love, love that you're, So your daughters are Dolly and, and Iggy? Yeah. So awesome. And Dolly's like a sort of, um, she's like a sort of strange, she's like Snow White or something. She sort of runs around the house singing weird sort of operatic. And she's wearing, like birds landing on her shoulder. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> the other ones. You're right. <laughs> Johnny Rotten. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> they're yeah. like they love each other Aww. and they're very different, but they they work together. That's like beautiful. all good double acts, really. Yes. I miss the double act. That's why I missed about the bush is that me and Julian were like one person. So if we were here now, we'd both be here and he wouldn't be talking because he's so weird and shy, and I'd have to talk for him. But you know, like it's Aww. marriage and you you have mm-hmm. your your strong points and your weak points. What was quite good about Dick Tevin was that I got to work with Hugh Bonneville and he was really funny from Downton Abbey. Yeah. Um, he had a similar energy to Julian and I found myself having quite a good double act with him. I just didn't think I was gonna have a good double act with him. And then we had to do some stunts. We had to jump off this huge bridge uh, on wires. And I haven't done that for a while. I did it in the bush, but we took off from the ground on wires so you can know the wires there and you feel safe. But when you just have to jump off a a bridge, you don't know if the wire's going to catch you. That's really scary. Right, that's the trust fall. And I was thinking, God, I'm not as brave as I used to be. It's probably having kids. You're always worried about it. It's true. <laughs> you know, it's I used true. to just go, this is fine. And I was going, and I looked over at Hugh, and I was thinking, it's Hugh Bonneville. He's going to be brave. And he just went, absolutely shitting myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, me too. And then... That is scary, though. Yeah. It was really you weird. You guys crushed it, though. But it was nice to do some stunts, and it was nice to be in something that was a bit like a film. You know what? Dick Turpin's got a big budget. It's Apple. So if we had a, you know, a stagecoach turning over, we could actually have a stagecoach turning yeah, over. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. In the bush, we would have made that out of cardboard right. and then animated it. And it would have taken six months. <laughs> Just people would have gone, what are you doing? It's made out of sponge or something. Yeah, so that was really nice to have a more filmic budget and a really good director. Ben Palmer, the director, was amazing. So that's... The writers are really good as well. The cast are really good. So it was fun anyway. So whatever happens, if people like it or not, it doesn't matter so much, really. We had fun making it. I hope people like it. People are going to love it. I loved it. And I just want to tell you that you are such a role model to me, that you continue to just challenge yourself and try things and incorporate all of your different passions. All my different weirdnesses. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to do a quick thing called deep cuts. Deep cuts. Yeah, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Here we go. I'm always ready. Name a song, album, or artist that changed your life. Pink Floyd, Dark Side, uh, no, not Dark Side of the Moon, Piper at the Gates of Dawn. Sid Barrett changed my life. Brilliant. Love Sid Barrett. Psychedelic music blew my mind. Yeah. Arnold Lane, see Emily play. Couldn't, I think I, uh, I, as a kid, I couldn't quite unprocess it or understand it. I had to ask right. my dad about it. What is this? And it's like, how's, what's happening? I know, it's what's happening, <laughs> what's exactly. Happening? Yeah. <laughs> really exciting. And then getting into lots of other psychedelic bands from the 60s and loving all that stuff. And the fact that they were kind of referencing Lewis Carroll and Edward Lear and stuff that I then later went on to like and enjoy. But yeah, amazing. Psychedelic It's groundbreaking. Music. Yeah. Yeah. What was your first concert? Oh, I don't uh, It might have been something like Kiss or Bowie or Status Quo. I mean, Quo. look at your first, I mean, it's ridiculous. Status You're so Quo. lucky that you had these as your <laughs> well, first concert. My dad used to go or every Coolest. week to a different, Motorhead, Hawkwind, they used to go to everything. And if I didn't go, they would bring me like a badge of Hawkwind. I used to collect badges and I had so many. So they must have gone to see everybody, like every heavy metal or heavy rock band, Blackfoot, White Snake. Just everyone, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, everyone. Oh my God. They had immaculate, so cool. they have immaculate taste, taste, my yeah. mom and dad. Immaculate wow. taste. Goals. That's good parenting. Really good parenting. Yeah, really good parenting. I'm trying to get what my children. What are you playing children. for your girls? Well, we, sometimes I just play like female artists mm-hmm. and say, these are just all, you know, amazing, like peaches and, you know, yeah. amazing stuff. Or we have themes, you know? Yeah. And then there's stuff that they respond to, so they might, because they're little, they like Dali used to like red hot chili peppers. I cool. noticed awesome. that she quite liked that, I and I was that. like, okay, so I play a little bit more of that. I just sort of watch them and see what they responded to. But the little one, the three year old, any music you put on, she starts dancing Aww. straight away. So I think she's got a real it's musical ear for it. Yeah, it's weird. You could put on anything, and she's she's it's she's innate for her. Out. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I hate to think what kind of music she'll be making. <laughs> I'll be terrified. <laughs> Well, then she's done her job right, because you should make music that scares your parents. Scares that is true. Parents. Really hard to rebel when I was a yeah. kid, my parents were like... <laughs> they were like the cause. Yeah, I was just like a square kid going, I want to listen to Adam Ant. And they were like, this is White Snake. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, all right, here we go again. Yeah. 
<laughs> you couldn't really outcall my parents. It's that true. Well. I think Although probably, Adam Ant's pretty amazing. I think maybe when I started listening to a little bit of hip hop, like Della Soul and oh, stuff like Della that, Soul, yeah. my parents had no frame of reference, no reference for that because they were pure rock. Although my dad likes reggae and they like classical and they like, you know, a Tangerine Dream, stuff like that. But I think maybe hip hop, they didn't know anything about that. So that was the one time that I felt like I managed yeah. to find something that my parents didn't really know about. And they didn't not like it. Right. But they were like, oh, we don't know what this is. That's, all, that's liberating. You're yeah. like, I discovered like this. To find three feet high yeah. and rising by Dallas Soul that's in amazing. order to, uh, to uh, perplex my parents. But they, they probably liked it. They probably, that's good. You've good taste. I mean, that's just actually like, went, yeah, it's not really is rebelling. Good. It's just sort of like, you should know about this. <laughs> yeah. I'm like introducing it to you. <laughs> exactly. Um, what is something your fans would be surprised to learn about you? Wow. Everyone thinks I'm quite happy and easy going and quite. I think with comedians are often battling some kind of anxiety or de not depression, but so it's difficult. It's easy for com I'm quite sensitive, so yeah. I think I'm a highly sensitive person. So I think I can tip over into uh, I can sort of turn I can dissolve mm -hmm. <laughs> like a Barocca, like a bath bomb. Yeah. I can sort of things can become quite dramatic and uh, frightening for me a lot easier than other people because I'm quite sensitive. So I think certain things affect me much yeah. in a deeper way than mm -hmm. a stronger, other people are a little bit stronger, especially world issues, things, the state of the world, things like, I can't focus on those things too much because I crumble. You internalize quite, them so much. I s yeah. yeah, slightly sort of start to feel a little bit broken by things yeah, like that. I get so I it. think I always try to project a sort of happy go lucky, charming, carefree, sort of otherworldly character. And I wish I was that <laughs> I wish I was that guy. <laughs> but I'm quite neurotic. <laughs> I think all comedians are quite neurotic. Mm -hmm. But I think my fans would be surprised to think that I worry about everything and I'm quite neurotic. They probably think I'm quite happy all the time. Well you are human. You are a human being. Yeah. <laughs> so there is that. You don't want to be another neurotic person. Though. Everyone's neurotic these days. So you want to sort of be someone who looks like they're having a good time. I remember when I was a little kid, I always loved people who looked like they were having, people who laughed a lot, people that made jokes all the time, people who looked like they're having fun. Mm -hmm. I always gravitated towards those yeah. people, those positive people yeah. who looked like they were going through life. And they had some sort of secret. They were always laughing. I had very funny people in my family. My uncle was really funny. I used to love funny people. It was like a magic trick. If they made yeah. everyone laugh, I'd be like, oh, what's that? What's he done mm -hmm. there? How are you doing that? And my mum was very funny. Lots of people I surround myself with are very funny. And I feel like it's a good survival yes, it is. technique. I love funny people. And I love people who laugh. You know people who got a really good laugh? And yeah. they just laugh all the time. And it's really infectious and giggly. I love that. I love those people for that. Those real hearty laughers. Yeah. They're my favorite people. People who barely laugh, I always am suspicious about. Well, then you would like me because my laugh is pretty horrifying. Like when I watch anything back, I can't watch it because I'm like a guffawing, like a, I sound like a, like a pirate. I laugh like a pirate. Like, like Jimmy Carr. Yeah, it's not great. It's not my great. mom's got a very dirty laugh. Oh my laugh. God, I laugh with everything I have. It's yeah. Like, <laughs> I love that. You know, it's not good. You're a comedian's dream. Yeah, oh, I, I, I am actually. Um, what... Do you have any regrets? Uh, yes, but I try not to. I think when the Bush had, the Mice Bush had done all it could in England and we came to America and there was a moment here when we were very hot, fleeting moment where, you know, uh, Ben Stiller was getting in touch and Mike Myers and uh, Jack Black and... Uh, we got offered a couple of shows here and I really wanted to come here and try and see if we could make the Mighty Boosh work here. And I think it was the wrong time for Julian. He just had two kids and, you know, and we would have had to move here for five years maybe and try mm. and see. I would love to have had a go, you know, and I think it was just wrong timing for him. So I always regret, regretted that we missed that moment. You get like a window. You get like, you've got like a sort of shelf life, haven't you? Or you've got like a moment where things are possible for you and you've got to leap in and he didn't it wasn't the right time for him and now that I've got kids I realize you that get it. I've just had I've got two kids so I totally understand why he didn't want to uproot and come to America and 
he was in a different place, you know? But that was one little regret because I, I always felt like we could, our stuff was on Adult Swim and, and we had a cult, good cult following here. So we could have tried to, to do something. I think we could have probably done a, seri- a couple of series and a, a film or something. Yeah, so that was a bit of a regret. Do you think wise. the bush could come back? Yeah, may, yeah. I don't know why I say right. it like it can't. Right, like it could <laughs> like be. Like we're both dead. <laughs> yeah, like it's lots of time. I could like just you call could, him now. You really <laughs> could just Julian. call him up and I be know. like. I try and get him in Dick Turpin. I should have got him in Dick right. Turpin. Right. It's so weird. When we see each other, it's like we don't have to say anything, but we went through a lot together and we still love each other. Yeah. And we're like brothers. And he was a bit older than me and I was very uh, in awe of him actually, because he's such a brilliant comic performer and such an unusual character, you know, and very artistic and very, uh, he doesn't compromise and he doesn't care. So he's got that element to him, you know, he'll he'll say we need to do this because that's what's good. And he doesn't care. He's not sort of trying to, uh, make something so that it can be successful. He doesn't care about that at right. all. He's quite sort of artistically pure in that way. Yeah. And I miss that. He's quite single-minded, you know? And we work really well together because all of my skills he didn't have and all his skills I didn't have. So we were like one human being together. Aww, like a perfect compliment. <laughs> On yeah. our own, we're both hopeless. No, but we could <laughs> get that together. <laughs> I try not to have regrets because I think, what's the point? And also... It's difficult, isn't it, to live in the present? I think it's what it's all about, mm. really. You're always sort of thinking, looking back. I think it's very easy to keep looking back and imagine it was, it was better than it was. And I think also people are endlessly looking forward and no one, people don't, they're not in the moment, are they? It's difficult. It's, that's the hardest thing. If I could teach my kids anything, it was to be in the present. And kids are so good at that. They, they don't are. really need teaching. Yeah. But as they get older, it'd be good if they could just enjoy this now. Exactly. Like this room and that, you know, cookie and this glittable if you could just be yeah. here now exactly that's it that's the key it is if you could key. just enjoy this so hard though we're just going backwards or forwards it's like we're never quite you know you're in right the moment i'm quite good at it yeah but i think we can all be better at it we right? can all be better at it I, I really pride myself in being in the moment as much as possible i'm so grateful yeah. for this moment with you Noel. i know honestly. this has been really good fun thank you so much I i'm love so it psyched for dick turpin i don't like, want to leave this room oh, <laughs> it's like a cave. i love you <laughs> i feel I, like you made this room for me oh, it's like a cave a I, rock I kind of did I like kind of did. I, I'm glad that we're connecting because I feel like I feel very connected with you and yeah, aligned. It's like an onyx room, this, and it's got all the things that I like in it. And I feel like, I don't know, I just feel like we don't have, if you didn't leave this place, you'd be OK. <laughs> I know. Is it a time machine? Well, we're going to do our rock and roll baking <laughs> show here. So th- that's next. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, Noel, thank you so much for thank being you. here. You are an absolute delight. I want you to keep staying here and I want to wear your coat. <laughs> we're going to be right back in just a moment. Thank you, that was easy. How awesome is Noel? I just adore him. He is lovely and hilarious and so multi-talented, and he is honestly goals, and I'm so glad he was here. Thank you so much for being part of the Allison Hagendorf Show presented by Cloudwater. I want to give a huge thanks to our other partners as well. Danny Wimmer Presents, Sweetgrass Vodka and Karma Sauce, and Road to Ruin Apparel, who made me this awesome bespoke kiss top. And most importantly, thank you. I would love to hear from you. So please like, comment, rate, review, whatever you're feeling, and reach out to me on socials at Allie Hagendorf. I'd love to connect with you. Let me know who I should interview next and what made you smile today. Thanks again. I'll see you next time. And remember, you're a rock star.